we were not intending uh, when the comptroller was here to have an opportunity for questions. He's only on the program for 30 minutes. Um, but actually, we think that we may be able to work in a couple of questions toward the end uh, after his remarks. He's going to be speaking to you unmoderated. And so uh, the same uh, drill with regard to submitting questions uh, applies, and one of my colleagues will ask those questions from, from the side. Now it's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's first speaker, Glenn Hager, the 36th Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts the chief financial officer of a state with the 10th largest economy in the world. He is our treasurer, he is our check writer, he is our tax collector, he is our procurement officer, and he has many other aggressively non-political and non-partisan roles and responsibilities. He was first elected to the job in 2014. He was re-elected one week ago with 53.2% of the vote. And a, and a better than nine point margin over his Democratic challenger, which qualifies as a Republican landslide <laughs> this election season. He previously served as Texas State Senator representing District 18 for nearly eight years and before that as a House member from District 28 for four years. He is a native of Houston. He has an undergraduate degree from Texas A&M University, a master's degree and a law degree from St. Mary's University and a master's of laws degree from the University of Arkansas. We are so fortunate that he made time to be with us today to talk about the health of and the prospects for the economy of rural Texas. Please join me in welcoming a very nice guy, the Honorable Glenn Hager. Now you're dead, right? Now you're right back. Thank you, Evan, I think. Um, <laughs> it's good to be with you. It's great to be back here in College Station. As I was driving over, my wife gave me a call and said, you're on the road. And I said, yes, I'm leaving Austin. And she goes, oh, you're heading back to College Station. We were literally just here just a couple of days ago. So my wife is an Aggie. I'm an alum as, alumni as well. And we've got a 13-year-old daughter, a 10-year-old daughter, and a 10-year-old son. So we are brainwashing them to death. Uh, we get up here quite a bit, needless to say, and it has taken effect so far. But it's great to be with you. Uh, two comments to the introduction. I appreciate you listing all the things that, that we do in the controller's office, but Evan, next time you introduce me, please do not tell everybody I'm the tax collector. Really, that's, a, that's the only part, because every time I hear that, and I've been hearing that for obviously four years being in this elected office, Yet every time I hear that, it reminds me of sitting in the pews in Waller, Texas, which is not far from where I grew up in a little community called Hockley. If you drive down Highway 290, you blink, you miss it. But my family's been there for quite a while as I grew up on a family farming operation there, sixth generation Texan. But my grandfather on my mother's side, and the reason there in Waller where I graduated and went to public school system, is he was a Baptist preacher. And so every time I hear that tax collector, I think back of my grandfather giving those sermons about how they stone the tax collector in the Bible. And then lo and behold, many years later, his oldest grandson becomes the tax collector. And so I always wanted to ask him when he gave the uh, invocation to my swearing in almost four years ago, what was it like now uh, being the tax collector's uh, grandson? But it's great to be here. And the other one, I'll tell you a short story and then I'll come back to the economy. When Evan walked off and he said, honorable, and I took another kind of, uh, well, I don't know, gentlemen, if any of you in the room ever have those moments in marriage where you just go, that was really dumb. Now, I had one of those when I got sworn into office the very first time as a state representative back in 2003. At the time, as you know, if you've ever seen the House chamber floor, don't swear it in day. It's very crowded because 150 members and they have two chairs right next to their desk for family members. And when I ran, my wife and I had no children and my wife campaigned as hard as I did. And I firmly believe, you know, the reason I was elected was much as much as my wife as it was for me. So my wife needed to be at my swearing in, needless to say, my grandmother and grandfather from my Hager side, I needed them there because my grandmother, I knew, wouldn't make it to the next swearing in ceremony. So I had three people, two chairs. What do I do? So I made the decision that my grandparents would sit in the chairs, my wife and I would squeeze, thankfully she's a very petite small lady, we would squeeze into my chair on the house floor, problem solved. Now here's where the dumb moment is, gentlemen. I stood up, I took the oath of office. We like to have humor in our house. We like to have a little bit of laughter because I think it's really important for life and be able to get through those tough hurdles in, in life as you have. So any moment of levity is really important. And I sat down, and my wife, by the way, is a really strong Texas lady. Um, she's a very capable woman, very brilliant, very beautiful, but very, very uh, capable. And so I leaned over and I sat down and I whispered in her right ear and I said, you can call me honorable now. 
<laughs> so, Evan, you can tell people I'm the tax collector, for God's sake, don't ever call me honorable again from here on forward, because um, it reminds me of that look on my wife's face, and I'm trying to erase it from my mindset, um, and I keep laughing. I'm like, okay, that was dumb. Now, it's great to be back here, obviously, at my alumni, but I think it's great to have, have this uh, symposium, this forum here today, because, you know, Texas A&M does a significant amount of work in the rural communities, whether it's through AgriLife, whether it's the Forest Service, or the initiative of rural communities, health initiative. There's all kinds of work that's being done across the 254 counties here in the state of Texas, and those partnerships are extremely important. As the individual who one of the three core constitutional duties of this office is looking over the state economy, that's the thing that I talk and I deal with as much as more than anything else of the 3,000 employees and 26 divisions that are within the controller's office. We talk about the economy a lot because I get out and travel across the state of Texas, the 254 counties, and one of the things that I talk a lot about is the bigger sector of the state economy as a whole. You know, if you flash back four years ago, literally about four years today, Texas was the 12th largest economy in the entire world, which is pretty phenomenal to think about. Our little space in the world was the 12th largest economy in the entire world. You fast forward through the downturn in oil and gas, we had bad commodity prices, which you think, well, we still do. Yes, I realize that. You fast forward through downturn in manufacturing, a few industry sectors, a contraction in the state economy as a whole, maybe not each region of the state of Texas, but as a whole, in Texas, even though we had job losses in several industry sectors, contraction as a state overall, the state did not grow in 2016, yet surprisingly, Texas moved from the 12th to the 10th largest economy in the world. And you think, well, okay, how does that work? And some of you might think, well, I heard you're an Aggie. What kind of Aggie math did you use with zero growth in a state economy, job losses in several industry sectors, and you move from 12 to 10? That doesn't make sense. Well, in fact, the reason being is because two countries we moved over had a greater contraction than Texas, and who were they? Canada, and the other one is who? You've heard about them in the national media for four years now, Russia. That's hard to imagine. And as I travel around the state and look at the 12 economic regions, which I'm going to talk about a couple of the economic regions here in just a second, and, and one of the points that we talk a lot about, and I think part of this discussion here today is, what about the rural parts of the state of Texas? Because if you think about a couple of statistics and a couple of figures, which, which I mention quite frequently as the person who's looking at the economy and what's it going to do as we let it lead into a next legislative session, and in part every single morning when you wake up, and of course in rural areas, this doesn't apply to those of us who grew up and or live in the rural communities, but every single morning when you wake up in Texas, every morning, it's hard to imagine that there's roughly another 570 people that call Texas home just to, based on natural growth. And then there's another 520 people that move to Texas every single day. Or if you look in the last 10 years, Texas has gained 2 million jobs, which what does that mean? That's 25% of the job creation of the entire nation in the last two years. Or flashback to almost two years ago, the day before the last legislative session, and I made a comment then about how Texas in the prior 12 months of 2016 had grown 177,000 jobs. And then you fast forward to this summer, that had moved up to 360 in the prior 12 months. Well, the data we just got, now it's over 400,000 in the last 12 months. And so my point being is, as you talk about these different numbers, or you look at the health of the state treasury, of course, uh, one of the things I've gotten really good at since I've been in this job is the guy who collects the money and pays the bills is all the legislators, especially this time of the year, they ask me, say, Glenn, what does the revenues look like for next session? Is the economy doing good? Do we have more money? Now, I have purposely made a decision in my life, and I didn't realize that early on in life, I don't like to have a lot of things in my pockets, and I never have anything in my right pocket, but I've learned as the guy who collects the money and pays the bills, it's helpful when they ask you that to literally stand there and go, let me look. So I'll go, sorry, there's no money left. But as I make that joke, in fact, reality is, when we closed the books in the Treasury in August, the last fiscal year, and opened the books for September, our sales tax collections, which is the bulk of the health that drives the train of the state budget, is 10% higher than it was the year before. Or take total tax collections 12% higher than the year before. 
Natural gas tax collections, 46% higher than the year before. Or take oil severance tax collections, 61% higher than the year before. But then you take a back top and look at what does that mean across the entire state of Texas. And in fact, part of the discussion is, as we're talking about here today, what happens in certain areas of the state is not necessarily applicable to the rest of the state. And so that's one of the things that I really wanted to drill down a little bit more, and I really want to take time for, for a few questions if someone has them. I always find it very beneficial to hear about what's going on in some of the communities from, from your vantage point. But as we've talked about earlier today, what is rule? Well, let's say for number one, if we just define non-metropolitan communities, counties that is, to, as you all know, two-thirds of our counties are non-metropolitan. But in fact, if you add in other counties that have metropolitan areas, there's huge swaths of those that are very rural as well. You know, it's amazing when, when you really think about from the vantage point, people where I grew up in little county of Waller County, our family farming operation that's still there is part in Waller County, part in Harris County, and people go, oh, you're from Harris County. That's where all those people live. Well, when I grew up, downtown was nowhere near us. There was nothing for miles and miles away, and it's hard to imagine that even today with all the growth of the last 20 years, large portions of Harris County or my home county of today, Fort Bend County, are still very rural. So the point being is it's not just non-metropolitan communities, the two-thirds, it's large other areas that are really still classified as very rural communities. And if you look at the 28 million people in the state of Texas, it's really interesting to know in those non-metropolitan rural communities, the two-thirds of Texas counties, of the 28 million, there's three million. And people go, wow, when has all that happened? Well, if you think about and you look about the course of time of this state, most of the growth in this state has been along the Triangle Corridor, whether it's Houston to the Metroplex, through Waco, down to the Austin and San Antonio area. And that really hasn't changed other than now it's 1,100 people a day. Now, you have growth in other areas. And, and I've thought a lot about this topic today in part because if you drive towards Houston and you pass through Waller and you go through that little community called Hockley, I used to joke all the time that says, if you blink, you've missed it. But if you keep your eyes open, you'll see Hager Road, and yeah, that's us. Well now, across from our western boundary is a company that built a 90-acre under one roof project, 27 different lines of air conditioners that are rolling off, the little town where I went to school at, my grandfather preached at in Waller, Texas, less than 2,000 people, yet every single day at this facility they have almost 6,000 go work there every day. Or just five miles after you pass Hockley is the new loop around Houston. We're not in rural Texas anymore. And, and I've thought a lot about what is it for someone like myself when I graduated from school? Yes, I went to law school, and people said, oh, where'd you practice? <laughs> Hockley, Texas. I wanted to go back and work with the family, which was always the attraction for me to go back to. And if you talk about in rural communities, that's not necessarily always the opportunity. Uh, I was looking at the poll that Henson, y'all ran, and I was looking over that. Thanks for sending me. I didn't, I didn't publish it. Thanks for sending me a, a, a day's notice to look through it. And part of the point I wanted to talk about today is one of the things we have to look at is what are the economic opportunities and the growth in the state? Then you have to separate that out because this is such a large state. One of the things I was going to mention today is let's talk about some of those different regions. Let's say, for example, I don't know, let's pick the central region. Why the central region? Because we're in the central region. And if you look at the central region of Texas, that's 20 different counties. So yes, Bryan College Station is a large part of it. Colleen Temple is a large part of it. But there's a large area that is what? Very, very rural in between. Let's give you a couple of numbers. I think it's important to know that in that 20 region, 1.2 million people live, 4.6% of the entire state's population which almost equally is 3.6% of the state's employment. And one of the interesting things, and I talk about this all the time when I travel around the state of Texas, just in the central Texas region, those 20 counties, it's hard to imagine if you just broke out that region, 
from the rest of the state of Texas, and I don't get any ideas. We don't want it broke out. But if it was, from a take-home pay perspective, the people that live in those communities is about $45 million. And you go, well, that sounds like a lot. What does that mean? Well, in fact, what that means is that would be the 45th state in the nation for take-home pay. And here's the point, and I'll repeat this with a couple of others, that every single community across the state of Texas in those regions is larger than at least a few other states in the nation. And as I was rolling up here today, you know, as a, as a guy who grew up on a family farming operation, I used to say when we had bad weather and we had bad commodity prices, which seems like nine out of every 10 years on a family farming operation, and I used to give my speeches as a state legislator, you know, state legislators make $600 a month. And I used to always kind of get a slow tone at a certain point. You know, I'd talk about, thank God my wife is employed and this and that. And I'd go, you know, my wife just, I'm really thankful for Dara. She supports my bad habits. And you could see people's faces and they're like, oh my gosh, is this turning into an intervention? What is he talking about? And at that point, then I could see I've kind of drawn a few of the people in the crowd, and then I'd say, well, the bad habits are number one. I'm in the legislature, and I only make $7,200 a month, or $7,200 a year. And then on top of that, sometimes as a farmer, somebody who's involved in a family farming operation, geez, that's more income than I make on the farm. You know, so that's why, and then they go, oh, that's what he's talking about, support his bad habits. But, you know, that is a challenge is my point for a lot of people involved in rural communities, especially if you're involved in the agriculture side of it. And one of the points I was gonna make today is, and I was, I was driving over from Austin, and I was thinking about with our family farm and operation, how wet and bad of a year it has been. But then a few years ago, I swore with the drought, I would never complain about too much rain. <laughs> I haven't this year, but I've come real close. I'm trying to keep to that pledge, but it's just been a rough year. And so I was thinking, and I thought, okay, you know, those involved in the agriculture side of rural communities, what do you need? High commodity prices and perfect weather. But then if you think about it, a lot of rural areas, on at least the agriculture side, what's good and perfect weather for one commodity isn't so perfect for another commodity. They don't always mesh and match. And so, you know, what, what is it that uh, really attracts people to rural communities and I thought the poll was really interesting and I wrote to Jim and I said thank you so much for sending that it was really interesting because I just thought take a step back we talk about as you heard some of the the uh, county and city elected officials earlier and I imagine these are themes that were talked about significantly is what is it that we need to focus on I was reading some stats and my staff sent me the other day and if you look at rural Texas and, and really rural America scattered across, it's interesting to know what percent of kids, 17% of kids, don't have the ability to have access to high-speed internet. Which you go, well, does that really matter? <laughs> Do you know anybody in public school today? So in other words, they're not able to actually complete their homework. And it made me really think about, as you look across the state, there are significant benefits in living in rural Texas. And quite often, you know, for me, and I thought the poll was interesting because what are a couple things? We always want to have better jobs, and that's pretty much wherever we live. Better opportunities to jobs, higher pay, but then it takes our farm in Hockley, Texas. As soon as right across the street, you have that 90 acres under one roof, then you go, oh my gosh, did they have to move here? So I think that's kind of the quandary we have as a state is how do you balance what we really love as part of rural Texas and how do you make sure you have those job opportunities? And one of the things that I talk about quite frequently is that I think us as leaders in the state need to do a better job of trying to promote the economic development opportunities across the state of Texas and not just in certain concentrated of suburban urban areas. So I see that I've got five minutes left. Why don't I stop there and see if there's questions, comments, and complaints. And if there's anybody that is wanting to know if there's more money in the revenue estimate yet, <laughs> you're gonna have to wait till January. <laughs> We're still tabulating the numbers and uh, figuring out where the economy is going here in the health of the state of Texas. Questions, comments, or complaints real quick. Calm crowd. I have, you know? uh, yes. I have one from Brian McManus in Cameron County. 
How does the, the Supreme Court ruling on internet sales tax impact Texas's future revenue? Yeah, great question. Uh, if you look at internet sales tax in the state of Texas, most of the major companies that are collecting sales tax that are involved in internet, sell, in internet sales are collecting and remitting to the state of Texas. So roughly, we're still going through our rulemaking process now because of the Supreme Court case to make that effective in Texas. We've got a couple requests before the legislature for next session to deal with a couple of issues, one being a local sales tax, because as you know, the state collects six and a quarter, but there is not a uniform across the state of Texas, so how do we deal with that legislatively, and we need that to fix, but the short number is, out of a state, state treasury of about $108.5 billion a year state budget, a third of that federal, two thirds of that state dollars, we think really it's probably only about $200 million, maybe $300 million a year, positive impact to the state treasury, because the bulk of those dollars are already being collected by your large retail companies that are having online presence. What will the first post Harvey state budget look like? What, it, what will it mean for rural communities hoping to shake a bit more money loose for education, healthcare, and other needs? Is every extra penny spoken for? Every extra penny will always be spoken for in some shape, form, or fashion. That's human nature. Uh, regardless, it'll be spoken for. But if you look right now at the state budget, the legislature will have to spend, I think, from a supplemental appropriation need, as in funding for Medicaid, funding for a few other things that have to be paid for to get through August of next year, including Hurricane Harvey, which I use, continue to use a, a billion dollars. I think it's about $4 billion. Now that means that most of that can be funded because revenues continue to grow and the state treasury continues to grow, hoping, barring that we don't have some global economic recession which will impact Texas. And so therefore my point being is the legislature may have to take Hurricane Harvey dollars out of the state savings account, but this month, when I make a transfer out of oil and gas severance taxes into that account, Texas will have $11.9 billion in our state savings account, our economic stabilization fund, which will be a record for Texas. So even if they take a billion out, that fund is very healthy. And the discussion we're continuing to have as we get closer to next session is how much money will be there for the next legislative session. <clears throat> and right now, the trends, it's very healthy. But I have to say, the thing that concerns me the most is that Texas, like the United States, we're having the longest growth economic recovery since the great financial crisis since 07. So in 07, we've had the largest expansion without a recession from a time-wise perspective. So I caution people that every single morning when you wake up, when you're in the longest recovery in modern history, that means every morning you're a little bit closer to the next recession. And when I'm given a revenue forecast that starts January, but the number doesn't start till September of next year and runs for two years later, I will tell you it scares me, not quite to death, but it scares me a lot, the fact that we're in that longest one. Will that shoe fall in the next two and a half to three years, which is what we're still continuing to monitor. But the point is, is right now the trends look good, which would mean the legislature will have more flexibility next session than they have had in the last session or two. Amazon's search for a new headquarters set off a uh, bidding war between cities offering up economic development incentives, which in turn set off a, a debate about economic development incentives. Are incentives like property tax breaks right, like right tools for rural communities, and how should they balance what they give up for what they get? Yeah, it's interesting. I'd spoke to a group of economic development corporations just here last month in, in Fort Worth as they had their, their uh, annual meeting, and I'd presented then a, uh, a questionnaire that we had just sent out not long ago and received back. We sent it to counties, cities, school districts, EDCs, and interestingly, in part because my office interfaces with local governments and tries to do educational opportunities on ways that we can help provide what are the tools that are out there. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're working on the right things, answering the right questions as we move forward and as I have staff that is aging out and the next ones are coming in. And interesting, the number one thing, the top thing on that list of all items that communities wanted help with was what? Economic development. That was number one. And, and then next was budgeting and processing, and then number three was what? Cybersecurity. Which that one doesn't surprise me. As the guy that has your money, cybersecurity scares the hell out of me. 
Uh, that's the one thing that people say, what keeps you up at night? It's my wife's look when I told her to call me honorable. And then the next one is uh, cybersecurity. But the fact is, is, you know, in a perfect world from my vantage point, my personal opinion, we would have to have no economic development incentives. But we don't live in a perfect world. And so the question then becomes, is it a trade-off, one, that helps development, job opportunities in areas, but is also a good return for who? The taxpayers at the end of the day. That's, that's the, the trade-off question. And, and I think it's important that we have those discussions. And long as it's open, it's transparent, and a lot of light is shine on what is being done, then I think the, the average person in Texas has confidence because they can see that those tools are actually bringing job opportunities, but not giving too much away that takes away from those job opportunities. Lawmakers often point out that Texas, Texans have among the highest property tax burdens in America. How does Texas rank in total tax burden once sales taxes and the lack of an income tax are taken into account, and is there room to grow to fund things like public education? Now, if you look at the overall tax burden here in Texas, compared to, and Texas is the second largest economy in the nation for its states, second largest in population as in, in the 50 states. In fact, of the top 10 states, largest states, because it's hard, how do you compare yourself to certain camp states when the whole state is 28 million people and they have 800,000. So you really need to compare yourself to the more populous states in part. And in doing that, Texas falls much lower on the spectrum far as an overall tax burden. But with that being said, the biggest issue, in my opinion, I've continued to talk about from a short-term perspective, long-term balance sheet issues or pensions, short-term balance sheet issues, is how are we going to deal with school finance and property taxes? And the two are very interwed. And we have, a, we have a publication that's coming out the end of this month or the beginning of next month that talks about school finance. And part of what it talks about is that the, the, the struggle the legislature is going to have to have, and this is something that is a new phenomenon that they've had before, is with the continued growth and pressurization in Texas, you are seeing rising property values, not just in certain areas, but across the state of Texas. And that means the contribution from the local side is higher in shifting the state side down. And so if you really want to deal with property taxes, it's really a school finance issue. And that is more of a, a phenomenon in the last decade plus than we've ever had before. And so part of this is trying to show what is the real issue and how do we tackle that issue. And I think that's really for Texas economic development and opportunities as well as the burden put on the citizens of this state. And it doesn't matter which of the 254 counties that you live in, that's the one issue that I think the legislature is gonna to have to tackle more than anything else. So with that, thank you all for letting me be here and may God bless you and God bless Texas. Thank you.